welcome back everybody. Today we're going to talk about the beginnings of astronomy. So we're going to start out with the farthest out section and then we move in toward the Earth Moon system. Okay, so let's first talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. This includes the entire range of radio waves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet radiation, x-rays, and gamma rays. Most of the stuff that we focus on is between 380 and 780 nanometers in wavelength because that's what visible light is and that's what we generally concern ourselves with. However, the electromagnetic spectrum is very important in helping us to identify and understand the universe. There are a couple of different types of telescopes and they collect electromagnetic radiation at different wavelengths. Refracting telescopes use convex lens to, lenses to focus light, and reflecting telescopes have a curved mirror in place of the objective lens. Stars can vary greatly in size. Giant stars are typically 10 to 100 times larger than our sun, and more than 1,000 times the size of a white dwarf. And this is actually one called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and it shows the different types of stars and... Um, classifies many, including our own, in the main sequence. Astronomers can use line spectra to identify the chemical elements in a star. Each element produces characteristic patterns of spectral lines. We can also classify a star's brightness as it actually appears in the sky, and that's called the apparent magnitude. Today, modern astronomers, with the use of telescopes, have expanded on the original classification systems to also include planets, the moon, and the sun. Another method of identifying a star's brightness is to imagine that all stars are an equal distance away. Now, this is kind of a little convoluted, so bear with me on this. This is the star's absolute magnitude and gives a more accurate indication of a star's true brightness. So our sun's absolute magnitude is 4.83, just to give you an idea. We can also use size and brightness to classify stars. There are bright supergiants, supergiants, bright giants, giants, subgiants, main sequence stars, and dwarfs. Star colors will also indicate the temperature that the star is burning at, so it goes from blue to red, so blue, white, yellow, orange, and red, and that's actually the, um, it goes from the highest temperatures to the lowest temperatures. And um, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, when they talk about an M-class planet, well, they're talking about a red star, um, or an orange red star, which is the same as ours. And so the M is actually referring to this star color classification based on the star's temperature. Astronomers use HR diagrams to classify stars and understand how stars change over time. The HR diagram is named after two astronomers, Enyar Hertzsprung and Henry Norris Russell, who were working independently of each other and made the same discovery. When the stars are plotted comparing their surface temperature and their absolute magnitude, a pattern is formed. And again, we're on the low end of the main sequence as far as our star is concerned. When we talk about distances to the stars, um, the distances in space are so great that miles or kilometers are not even practical to use. So rather than a unit of those, we use a light year, which is used to measure these distances. A light year is the distance that a photon of light will travel in one year at a speed of 168,000 miles a second. So that comes out to 5 quadrillion 865 trillion 696 billion miles. The sun, for example, is 8 light year minutes to Earth. And that's because it takes a photon of light produced by the sun 8 minutes to reach the surface of the Earth, which covers a a space of about 93 million miles. Parallax is also a method that astronomers use to measure the distance to nearby stars. Parallax is the apparent change in position of an object when you look at it from different places. An easy way to kind of see parallax in your own um, 
daily life is to hold up your finger um, and line it up with the corner of a room. When you line it up with the corner of the room, then you close your left eye and look at it, and then you close your right eye and look at it. And whichever one shifts the farthest away from the corner, uh, the line on the corner, is, uh, also tells you which is your dominant eye, the one that didn't shift, but it also kind of shows you what parallax would be, because you see a shift in the way your finger looks against that corner line. Okay, so let's talk about life cycles of stars. Stars are formed within huge clouds of gas of hydrogen and helium and dust called nebula. As the gases and dust collect, heat and pressure builds up, eventually reaching a critical mass and temperature. Nuclear fusion, which is the joining of lighter elements to form heavier elements, signifies the beginning of a star, and that fusion continues on throughout the life of the star until it dies. The lifespan of a star is determined by its initial size and mass. Supergiant stars exist for only about a million years. Giant stars exist for 20 million years, and main sequence stars can exist for about 10 billion years. Our sun is sitting at about halfway through its lifespan at this point. As the star runs out of light elements to continue the fusion process, it will begin to undergo a death process. Changes in the internal temperature and pressure will cause the atmosphere of the star to expand and contract. Medium to low mass stars, or main sequence stars, will shed their outer atmosphere, forming a planetary nebula. The remaining core will become a white dwarf, and over time it cools and it becomes a black dwarf. And this is what will happen with our own sun as it dies. So, just to give you an idea, we start off with the protostar that is developed inside the nebula and fusion will begin and that starts the star. The star will stay on the main sequence for billions of years, usually around 10, and the star begins to run out of fuel. Finally, the star will become a red giant, then a white dwarf, then a black dwarf. Now, the red giant is the part that's going to eat the planet. Um, the sun will expand that atmosphere will then envelop the Earth, and that will be all she wrote. However, we're talking about four and a half billion years in the future, give or take. High mass stars will explosively shed their outer atmospheres, becoming supernovas. The remaining core becomes a neutron star, which is smaller and denser than a white dwarf, and contains as much as three times the mass of our own sun. A spinning neutron star is called a pulsar because it produces a pulsating radio source. The most massive stars, which are 40 times the mass of the sun, explode and form a supernova, and all that remains in its interior is the star's gravity, and so it becomes a black hole. There's an estimated black hole in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, which is what this is showing you here. Most stars are members of groups of two or more stars called star systems. Star systems containing two stars are called binary stars, and those with three stars are called triple star systems. Proxima Centauri is a part of a triple star system, which also includes Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B. Many stars also belong to larger groupings called star clusters. Open clusters are loose, disorganized arrangements containing bright supergiants and lots of gas and dust. Globular clusters are large groupings of stars that are densely packed. And finally, galaxies are huge groups of star systems, star clusters, and gas and dust. There are three main categories of galaxies based on their general shape. There is the spiral, elliptical, and irregular. By the way, our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxies have a bulging central nucleus, and the arms spiral outward from the central nucleus. The arms contain many young, bright stars, and older stars are found in the nucleus. 15% of the observed galaxies are spiral galaxies, and some spirals appear to also have a huge bar-shaped region of stars through the nucleus and it's called a barred spiral. 
elliptical galaxies will appear round, oblong, or flattened. They have no spiral arms and are generally smaller than the other types of galaxies. They contain very many bright young stars. Most common uh, type of galaxy is an elliptical galaxy, and about 70% of all galaxies that we've seen are elliptical. Finally, irregular galaxies have no regular shape, thus the name, because again, scientists are really great at creatively naming things. These are smaller than the other galaxies and also account for about 15% of all the galaxies we know of. And finally, we're getting closer to home. The Milky Way is our solar, uh, is where our solar system is located, and we're out on one of the very outer spiral arms. From the side, the Milky Way appears to have a narrow disk with a bulge in the middle, and the galaxy's spiral structure is visible only from above or below. Finally, the universe is so immense that the best method of describing its size is to use scientific notation. In other words, it's ten, powers of 10. Scientific pa notation uses powers of 10 to write large or small numbers. The bright star Deneb is about 3,230 light years from Earth. To express this number in scientific notation, it would be 3.23 times 10 to the third light years. So this is how we manage very large numbers. Astronomers think that the universe has been constantly expanding outward since the Big Bang, and that's based on the Doppler shift of light. Okay, that is going to conclude our kind of general overview of astronomy. We're going to move on to our own solar system next in the next lecture. Have a great day.